Hey. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone to Economics of Platforms Online Seminar. Today we have Seth, Seth Benzel uh, this, uh, uh, <laughs> presenting uh, how to govern Facebook. Uh, he's joint work with uh, Avinash Collis and uh, Alex White uh, discussing. Uh, Seth is, will have 40 minutes for presentation and Alex will have five minutes for discussion. Then we will have general Q&A and discussion. Uh, and I will stop recording after an hour, but I will uh, stay here for as long as there is a need and, uh, and, and, and discussion. So uh, with that, Seth, uh, the screen is yours. Take it away. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you so, so much for having me here at Toulouse. Um, I have to say that uh, this paper has uh, some pretty deep uh, Toulouse uh, ties. Um, first off, obviously, whenever you're writing about multi-sided platforms, you're going to be heavily indebted to uh, Professor Tyrell. But more specifically, I can say that the Toulouse Digital Economy um, Workshop was one of the first digital economy, uh, really, really the first digital economy conference I ever attended, really got me excited about the field. And my co-author, Avinash Kalas, who I think is on the line, did his master's here at uh, TSE. So there's, a, there's some pretty deep uh, TSE roots here in this paper, um, and, which is titled, How to Govern Facebook, a Structural Model for Taxing and Regulating Big Tech. So I'm gonna launch right into it. Um, again, this is joint work with Avinash Kalas. Um, let's take it away. So, uh, Digital platform businesses create value by enabling connections. So we can think about lots of different platforms. Um, you know, I'm going to focus here on Facebook because they're relatively easier to collect data on. Um, they are very clearly making their uh, value added in enabling connections between pairs of pay people. But if you think about a multi-sided platform like Uber, where you're connecting riders to drivers, or eBay, where you're connecting auctioneers to buyers, Kind of the fundamental thing going on in these digital platforms is the enabling of a connection, which then the platform is going to sort of monetize in some way. Um, these digital platforms are able to scale really rapidly because they have pretty low marginal costs and pretty fixed capital needs, right? If Airbnb wants to roll out to a new city, they don't have to buy or build a new hotel in the way that Four Seasons, if they enter a new city, needs to. Rather, they flip a switch on a server and people show up with all of the fixed capital that's needed in order to provide their share of the service. And then finally, these companies all collect lots of data. Um, these features have made digital platforms a really fundamental part of our COVID-19 world. I know that um, it's really kind of hard to think about trying to go down this lock through this lockdown without um, our social media and our digital communication tools. Um, but all of this power that these digital economy um, platforms have also create large supply and demand economies of scale and therefore raise monopoly concerns, right? So on the supply side, we've got this economy of scale that just comes from being an information good, right? Which is you write the code once and then you can sell it a million times. But then these platform goods also have these demand side economies of scale, which is as more people use the platform, the quality of the platform itself improves, at least in general, um, especially because most of these platforms have tools to make sure that you're only connecting to people that you have a positive network value from. In general, you can imagine a neg negative network effect from some people joining platforms. Okay, so that's kind of the big concern is that these platforms have lots of power and if anything, COVID-19 has made them more powerful. But what should we do about that? Well, there are a bunch of ideas that we'd like to try to evaluate and put side by side. So for example, we know in France, you've got the digital services tax that you've been talking about, which would be incident on these giant companies. And for a company like Facebook, this tax is gonna be basically incident on its advertisements because advertisements are 95% of its revenue. Another, and that's, so that's an idea for trying to take some of the profit and sort of redistribute it towards the users. You know, French users say, I'm giving my eyeballs towards Facebook and Amazon and Google. I want some share of the monopoly profits that's being created by that. A sort of more direct way of, of attacking the same issue is this idea of data as labor, which maybe Alex will have some insights at, uh, on. Um, so there the thinking is try to um, promote collective bargaining on behalf of the people who are using the platforms. 
And then um, they can go to the platform and say, hey, as a group, we're only gonna use the platform if you give us X percentage of the revenue, or you can imagine the negotiating being more complex than that. Another approach uh, is to try to promote competition on these digital platforms, when the idea that that'll lower, um, that'll sort of raise quality and drive out these monopoly profits. And Fiona Scott Morton has a lot of ideas about how to do that, particularly this idea of encouraging interoperability. So people could enter with a platform and then use essential data that was originally created on another platform, such as I could enter with a social network and then just use Facebook social graph. That would promote entry. And then finally, people have talked sort of more broadly about just sort of breaking up these companies. And those breakups could either be horizontal, so you could end up with two sort of baby Facebooks that do the same thing, or they could be vertical, right? You could split up Facebook from Instagram, for example, and maybe those things, those two platforms are more complements than substitutes. Although obviously that's an open question. So let me give you sort of a very, very high level result preview. First, we're gonna find that Facebook generates seven times as much social per surplus as it creates from ad revenues in the US, right? So it's the important place to start is when we measure it, we're finding a lot of social surplus from Facebook in particular. And again, we're taking a more general model we're gonna calibrate it for Facebook. We find that Facebook's market power lowers welfare by nine percentage points versus the first best, which is a, a nationalization of Facebook and then a subsidy for use and then 4% versus perfect competition. But those, those numbers are gonna vary depending on exactly what counts in social welfare. Kind of most obviously in our calculations, we have no negative externalities from Facebook or social media use. Although that's a big sort of social concern right now is, is there something about the social media that's poisoning our politics or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also it's gonna be important for thinking about Facebook's motivations because we're gonna find that Facebook wants to have a larger user base that's implied by pure profit maximization. And so we wanna to try to understand why does Facebook wanna be big? Because that's gonna uh, inform our decision about do we wanna reward that behavior of being big? Um, taxes are mostly incident on Facebook and property to properly targeted taxes can actually raise consumer surplus. So the intuition there is if Facebook both has the goals of making ads through revenues and maintaining a large user base, you can actually get them to substitute into their large user base motivation by taxing um, advertising. And so when they shift into that, that's better for society because we think that there's an inframarginal network effect that Facebook doesn't fully internalize, that really we would want more people to be on Facebook because of these positive network effects that again, Facebook doesn't 100% internalize. Um, and uh, Alex can tell us all about the Spence distortion. Um, and then finally, a botched breakup would be disastrous. Again, this is very much in what Alex and Wilde have talked about, right? Which is letting the right one win. Sort of the worst case scenario is you break up one of these big platforms, but don't any get any gains in competition. Whereas data and labor, potentially even better than what I call the first best above, uh, because then you could you know, show people advertisements and sort of arbitrage that because people get less disutility from viewing advertisements uh, than they create in revenues from watching those advertisements. So if somehow data as labor could preserve that arbitrage, there's a surplus to be made. Okay, briefly literature review. I wanna just highlight this series of papers here. Obviously I'm indebted to Professor Ty Roll as well as Professors Parker and Van Alstein. And then um, another set of papers I'm indebted to is Weil and Weil and White. Um, and before them comes Rolf's 1974, which is this really interesting paper about Bell tele in the uh, Bell uh, Journal of Economics about telephone networks. But a lot of those ideas really only became manifest today with today's social networks and today's digital platforms. Okay, so what does our model look like? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lay out my model I'm gonna tell you some sort of theoretical results for it. Then we're gonna calibrate it from Facebook. And then I'm gonna be able to, in this structural model, do some counterfactual experiments of how will welfare and profits change under different universes. So what's in our paper? What's in our model? So we've got a platform firm, which is a monopolist, and it's gonna maximize profits, but maybe also cares about having a shadow value for a large user base. And in order to maximize their objective function, which is the sum of their profits and wanting to have a large user base, 
they're going to set prices, subsidies, or advertising levels. And then obviously, and then we could adapt this to different settings with different sort of pricing schemes. Consumers decide whether or not to use the platform. And importantly, you're, because this is a network good, your desire to use the platform is going to be a function of others' usage as well as how heavily the platform is being monetized. So when I say monetized, I could either mean you know, how much I'm being charged in terms of a monthly subscription or how many ads am I being required to watch when I use it. Um, and now this sort of network dependence is really important, you know, because if something happens to the platform and I leave the platform, that's gonna have reverberations on everyone on the platform who likes me. So like, let's say that Alex likes being connected to me on Twitter. If I stop using Twitter, then that's gonna have a negative effect on uh, Alex's use of Twitter. And then if he leaves, there's some potentially cascading effect of everyone he likes leaving. We're gonna say that consumers are potentially heterogeneous in what they value. And that's what makes this a multi-sided platform instead of what's typically thought, of, instead of like typical two or one-sided networks, right? So when I say they're heterogeneous, what they value, for example, um, some, uh, some demographic groups might have a larger opportunity cost for using Facebook. So uh, you might have just something better to do than using whatever platform we're talking about. You have a better opportunity. Or alternatively, there can be differences in network effects, right? So I'm gonna show you some interesting heterogeneity that we find in what sort of connections are value on Facebook across different demographic groups. And then finally, uh, we can allow for the different groups to have different disutility from, view, from monetization, in this case, viewing ads. Okay, so this is what the platform's problem looks like. We're gonna maximize our profit, which is phi I times PI minus F. So phi I is gonna be the net revenue, and you can also think that this includes the shadow value in there, is the net benefit of having person I use your platform, and then PI I is the probability that I uses your platform. And then for, from the perspective of the platform, your PI, I, so the probability that any individual uses your platform is gonna be a function of this vector of monetizations that you do on every site, right? And so you can imagine for every individual, the platform is choosing the monetization strategy that gets them the most revenue for the least disutility that they're creating, right? And you're gonna choose a vector of these points for every individual and that's gonna to lead to a certain equilibrium. Consumers on the other hand are gonna participate if their utility from participating is higher than their opportunity cost, which is gonna be uh, have follow a distribution. Um, in our calibration, we're gonna be, we're gonna assume it's distributed such that um, people's desire to use the platform is logarithmic. Um, in um, observables. Uh, their utility from participating is a function of all others decision to participate. So that's the equilibrium, the network equilibrium. So I's probability to use the platform P is a function of others use and how much I'm being monetized. So I only, in, so it, on, if we're on Twitter, I only indirectly care if Alex is being forced to watch lots of ads. As long as Alex is on the platform, I get the benefit of Alex being on the platform. I don't care if he's being slightly unhappy or when he's on Twitter because he has to watch ads when he's on Twitter. I only indirectly care if those advertisements get him to stop using Twitter and then I might stop using Twitter. Okay, so uh, there's gonna be a distribution of opportunity cost that's gonna give you a logit demand function for each group. You're gonna be in equilibrium where you've got this symmetry, right? The probability of me using is optimal given the probability of everybody using. And then the way kind of computationally we're going to solve for moving to new equilibria is that after there's a disturbance, so for example, after a new tax shows up and Facebook changes its level of advertising, we're going to move to a new equilibrium after a series of cascades of the network effect, right? So again, imagine advertisements go up on Alex. He uses the platform 50% less. That convinces me to use the platform 25% less. Everyone connected to me is now using the platform 10% less, et cetera, et cetera. What's important is that for the equal, current equilibrium to be stable, the, the, this infinite sum of cascades has to have a finite sum, right? Um, it doesn't have to have a finite sum and that means that you were in an unstable equilibrium to start. The way I'm thinking about it in this time of coronavirus is with R0, right? So we all know that if R0 is the odds that any individual tra will transmit the virus to another person, if you have R0 equal to or greater than one, 
eventually the entire, you know, one infection is going to infect the entire society. But if you have R naught slightly less than one, one infection is going to infect 0.9 people, is going to affect 0.8 people, blah, blah, blah. And that sum is going to be not infinite. Um, and here's just an illustration of uh, stable versus unstable equilibria. And so we're going to assume that Facebook starts in a stable equilibria. And actually, actually, that's not actually an assumption. We, we can, um, in alter the model that we write down can certainly computationally say, hey, you're starting in an unstable equilibrium. I can say empirically, it looks like Facebook starting in a stable equilibrium, which makes this analysis possible. Okay. So, so Seth, yeah. yeah, please. Seth, can I ask a question? What's the distinction between omega and mu? You've got omega of yeah. mu, and why do you need both of them? Why do I need omega of mu? Oh, yeah. Um, the reason is that mu is the utility that I get from the platform given this setting. And then omega is converts the utility of the platform into a probability of use, right? So basically what the omega has in it is the random opportunity cost. And how are you going to be able to measure, distinguish them because they... So what we're actually gonna do, and uh, you'll get more details later, is we're actually okay, gonna kind fine. of directly solicit utility so we're going to ask people, what, you know, um, how much would you be willing to pay to give up Facebook? That's going to give us kind of a demand curve. And we're going to say what's generating that demand curve is these random opportunity costs. Okay, thank you. So, okay, and I can, I'll go into more detail if that's not clear after I get to that part. Okay, so again, theory side, what we're going to do is just ask, what is, um, what's the first order condition for the platform? Again, that's gonna be an infinite series. So just to keep things simple here, I'm just showing the first two terms of the infinite series, right? So should I increase the level of advertising on person number one? Well, if I do, I get more money from them if they participate, PI, but I lose the odds that they stop using the platform because I raised the fee on them times the amount by which I raise the fee. So D mu I, D phi I, that's the disutility from the fee. And then D omega I, D mu I, that's how much less do you use the platform because your utility went down. So that's the distinguishment. And then now we have this network effect, which is if person I leaves, that's gonna discourage all of the J's that I likes or encourage all of the J's that I doesn't like to leave or stay. And of course, if the J's participate, then you get to collect uh, net revenue from them fee sub J, okay? Um, and of course, you can sum additional uh, terms into this. So what's kind of the takeaway here? Well, this guy over here is just sort of classic third degree price discrimination. And we just get this extra series of terms, which is sort of the, net, the right way to price discriminate if you have these network effects. So you should increase fees on those who inelastically demand the platform and decrease fees for those who provide lots of value to other people, especially when those other people pay a lot of money to the platform. And again, so this is very much in the tradition of Jean Tyrol, you know, do I subsidize side A or side B? Well, you, should, um, you shouldn't subsidize the side that inelastically demands the platform. You should subsidize the elastic side and the side that makes network effects. So, okay, now we're gonna calibrate the model. So to do that, we're gonna survey Facebook users. We're gonna use Facebook uh, because it's a ubiquitous social network. So it's easy to find people who have opinions about Facebook on, when polling. Um, we're gonna get 73,000 responses on Google surveys. Um, of those, we're gonna use about 50 in the final analysis. We're gonna use Google surveys and Google surveys um, has a registration of subjects, age, range, and gender so that's how we're going to divide up the universe into 12 demographic categories by age and gender. Um, the way that we're going to solicit these demand functions is we're gonna ask questions of the form. Would you accept $10 a month to give up Facebook? Would you accept $15 a month to give up Facebook? Would you accept $20 a month to give up Facebook? So that's following the Alcott and all AER paper as well as Brynjolfsson, Collis and Eggers. So that strategy, but we're not gonna come around the end and actually do the enforcing of the, the, the way that you actually would hypothetically guarantee that someone's revealing their true preference is that you do this as a sealed bid auction, right? We don't actually do the sealed bid auction part. We just ask people to, you know, yes, no, do you accept this offer? 
Um, in the Alcott et al. paper, the sort of the non double blind sealed bid uh, responses aren't very different than the ones you get if you just ask. So we feel on sort of solid ground and you'll see that our demand curve that we estimate uh, overall is very similar to what these other guys found. So I wrote down a very, very general utility function, but we're gonna have to be more specific uh, to actually bring it to the data. So this mu i, so what's the value from the platform if you decide to use it? It's gonna be the sum of the utility that person I gets from J if J uses the platform times the number of people who are type J in America times the probability that someone in group J uses the platform um, times ZI of J, which is the probability that we're friends given that both of us are using the platform and then minus the disutility from advertising. So what I wanna point out here is all of these guys are linear so, um, and that's just has to do with data constraints. Of course, we think in the real world that people's utility from digital platforms might be highly nonlinear in lots of ways. You can think of this as an approximation that's going to be better when we're closer to the start and maybe a little bit weaker as we think about more extreme scenarios. Um, we're gonna think about opportunity costs being distributed such that omega i is logistically distributed so that when we fit a logit curve to the demand function that's gonna make sense. Um, and then we're gonna think about that demand curve and the initial probability of use being separately identified for each demographic group. And then of course, we're also bringing data from Facebook on revenues for each demographic group, uh, which are based on Facebook's quarterly reports and API. Again, there's some approximation there because they don't tell you everything you would wanna know ideally. Um, like I said, the questions are generally of the form would you give up Facebook for one month in exchange for X dollars? Choose yes if you don't use Facebook. And then we can ask the same question for different demographic groups. Would you give up all connections to people on Facebook of demographic group X for one month in exchange for X dollars? We rebalance those so that those add up to 100% of the value. So we're just gonna assume like we do here that, this, that the value of Facebook is the sum of the value of connections to all individual friends on Facebook which again, isn't necessarily the case. Of course, Facebook can have other benefits beyond that. Okay, so this is what our overall demand curve for all of the different groups look like. So again, we're asking these questions, would you give up Facebook for $5 a month? And so this dashed line is gonna be our demand curve overall, but of course we're separately doing it for each group. And as you can see, it's a little, it's a lot more precise than Brynjolfsson at all, because we're asking way, way more questions about a much narrower range of prices. But you can see it's sort of overall consistent with what they found for this demand curve. And as you can see, there's this sort of really long tail here, right? You can get up to a hundred, couple hundred dollars, and there will be a significant um, section of the population who would not give up Facebook. And so when you see these sort of average values of Facebook, a lot of that is kind of being driven by a long tail of people with high valuations. I, I will say these previous papers, they, they have this sort of demand curve in them, but they mainly focus on reporting median values. So one sort of innovation in this paper is taking that entire demand curve seriously and seeing if we can do something with the calibrated model rather than just focusing on median values. Um, so the next, so one of the things we calculate is sort of this network of network effects that each demographic group gives another demographic group. So here in this figure, it's a little bit of a hairball, um, shows the 124 values of all connections to from a member of one demographic group to another demographic group or to their own demographic group. Um, and it's uh, the size of the nodes has to do with the initial size of the user base. So older women are the largest user base on Facebook right now. So these are the most valuable connections. Each of these connections are on average worth more than 50 cents a month. And so the arrow is pointing towards who's getting the value. So female 65 plus very much value connections to young men, male 65 plus really value connections to middle-aged men and middle-aged women really value connections to older men. Um, so this is, these are the most, and so, and that's kind of a general pattern that kind of the value flows tends to go on Facebook from younger male people to older and more female people. Here's the top 10-ish most valuable connections. You can kind of see that flow that I talked about. This is just showing just um, how, how kind of 
flipped it can be. So female 65 plus getting a lot of value from everybody, especially young men. Um, whereas providing value out, not so much to young men at all, more to middle-aged people. Um, we can flip it around to young men, get very little value for most people, but provide a lot of value out. So, um, and then finally, so um, we tried to talk to Facebook to try to get as much internal data as they could, uh, as we could to calibrate this model as well as we can. They were not super helpful, as you might imagine, but they did give us one data set, which allows us to confirm one of the things we did. So this is from a data set that they have on connections between people of different age groups, the frequency of connections uh, amongst people of different age groups. And so on the x-axis is what we find as the percentage of friends who are between those pair of age groups. And on the y-axis, you have what they find. And you can see that there's a pretty strong correlation. Um, we don't perfectly hit what they think the ground truth is. There's no reason to think that we would be exact because we're kind of asking very loosely about friends and they're taking, they have a sort of very technical definition of what an active friend is. Um, but th I think there's some signal here. Okay. Um, so now we get to actually give you the results. So we estimate that Facebook in late 2019 for Americans 18 and older generated monthly 1.8 billion in revenue, 12 billion in consumer surplus and has 154 million users. Um, so the first question we need to ask is, is Facebook currently profit maximizing? Because we suspect they also have this large user base motivation that a lot of platforms has. So we're gonna sort of infer what that value is and then use it in all the simulations so that we can justify the current equilibrium through that part of their utility function. And then we're gonna evaluate all these different policies that I promised that I would. So what's right here is we just asked the question, what would happen if Facebook just tried to maximize current revenues and didn't care about having a large user base at all? So what they would do is they would raise advertisements a lot. So they would basically uh, tr uh, more than double the level of advertising. That's going to initially lead to a decrease in consumer surplus for lots of groups by a sizable fraction, but it's going to get worse as that network effect starts to percolate. So first we increase the level of advertising on these groups. Then what's going to happen is those groups are gonna use the platform a little bit less. That's gonna make everyone slightly more unhappy because now not only is there a higher level of advertisers, there's advertisements, there's less users on the platform. And that's gonna just keep on going until you reach a new equilibrium. One sort of interesting uh, result we have is that you don't need to calculate a whole lot of cascades. As you can see here, uh, at least in this current calibration, after three cascades, the, we basically achieved the new equilibrium to three significant digits. Um, so we say profit maximization would increase Facebook revenues by 2.3 a month, 2.3 billion a month. So why not do that? Well, because it decreases the user base by 49%. Right, and presumably Facebook doesn't want that. There's lots of different reasons why Facebook might not want a shrinking user base. And you can kind of divide them into two categories as is their motivation pro-social or sort of neutrally social? On the pro-social side, you might think that this is for future monetization, right? So I need a big user base so later I'm gonna be able to sell people Oculus and Libra and get good network effects from those. You might think that um, I'm collecting data because I'm going to make this really great product that I'm not selling right now, but eventually I'm going to. Um, and then what a final possibility is in this model, we're only modeling America. But if Americans had positive network externalities on users of the platform not in America, that would be a benefit to having a large American user base that's not captured in our monetary value because we're only modeling America. On the other hand, you might think that the platform just wants to be big to deter entry, um, or that it's based on sort of stolen data that um, the users haven't really internalized the disutility of that, and it's in some way sort of dishonest, this big user-based motivation. So um, it's a little bit ambiguous which of this is the right way of thinking about it. 
right now, I'm going to focus on the positive interpretation that Facebook having a big user base is for these sort of positive reasons of their sort of developing new products in the future, um, as well as, you know, trying to prevent their, their system from unraveling. Okay, so this is what I'm going to call the first best. So this is asking, how would a benign social planner run Facebook? Of course, it's a little bit unrealistic, but for just to give us a baseline. And then the other thing assumption here, which is why it's going to be possible for data as labor to actually look better than the first S, is here I'm assuming that ads must be eliminated rather than arbitrage. So here I'm saying Facebook, um, the nationalized Facebook is going to be making big investments in raising platform quality in addition by, in part by cutting ads which is different than um, the data is labor scenario where like platform quality doesn't change, but people are receiving checks in the mail for using Facebook. So what do we get from this? Well, we see that obviously, uh, not obvious, but we see that the nationalization first best entails running a subsidy for using Facebook, which is not surprising given that we think that there are some inframarginal network effects that a platform doesn't internalize. Um, and we find that we can boost social welfare by 9.6% by running this big subsidy. Um, now let's think about six different tax redistributive and regulatory policies and think about how close can we get to the first best with stuff that's a little bit less onerous than Bernie Sanders running Facebook for us. Um, first, I'm going to think about an ad revenue tax, so very similar to what uh, France has proposed or is, has implemented. I don't know if they've actually raised any of that revenue yet. We can think about a per user tax, which is sort of logically sort of the opposite approach. What if you wanted to sort of discourage uh, usage of Facebook and get a smaller user base? That would be an approach. And then finally, data as labor, which is modeled as Facebook rebating some percentage of ad revenues to users. Here, just to make the example sort of really um, extreme, we're going to assume that 100% of ad revenues are just rebated to users of Facebook. Um, Again, sort of the sort of the high level theoretical result I want to focus on here is that if you just multiply a one minus one minus tau, if you multiply this big tax on the front of that first order condition that I showed you earlier, you'll see it doesn't really if it, if it hits every part of Facebook's revenues that tax, it's actually not going to move the, the optimization condition at all. Right. So that's the sense in which Facebook is sort of inelastic to taxes. What makes them elastic to taxes, what makes them keeps them from being perfectly inelastic to taxes in this model is that a tax on digital ad revenues isn't going to be incident on this shadow value of maintaining a large user base. Again, so if you tax ad revenues, substitute into the large user base motivation. Um, and then the opposite. So if you tax the number of users, Facebook is going to have the optimate, optimal, uh, excuse me, the exact opposite incentive. They're going to want a smaller number of users who are each getting uh, monetized more intensely. Um, and so here are the results from those simulations. The things I want to highlight is a 3% tax on Facebook can potentially raise consumer surplus by 1.3 percentage points and social welfare by 1.1 percentage points. So the difference between those two coming from less ads being shown and so Facebook losing out on those revenues. Alternatively, if you tax the number of users, um, and in such a way that you collect the same amount of revenue, you're going to have basically no effect on welfare. So this is actually, it's, it's like negative 0.0. This is like negative 0.01. So let's talk a little bit more about taxes. So digital service taxes and ad taxes, what they're doing is they're changing firms' side versus revenue trade-off. And then theory suggests that platform quality and participation is going to be too small due to this spence distortion. So I've been talking about that. Let me say exactly what I mean by that. When you're a platform, what you care about is not maximizing total utility, but what you do care about is creating these network effects for certain J's, right? But who are the J's that you care, J being a certain alter, right? But who are the alters that you care about creating utility for? You only really care about creating utility for people who are going to pay you a lot of money in terms of advertising revenues if they use the platform, and people uh, who are marginal, right? You don't want to create utility for people who are always going to use your platform no matter what, right? Uh, from the perspective of the platform, that's wasted. However, from a social perspective, 
creating utility for people who are always going to use your platform no matter what is actually a positive. And so that's where the Spence distortion arises. It's the inframarginal network effect as opposed to the marginal network effect. Okay. Um, so again, just to summarize our tax results, and then of course there might be more nebulous externalities. Right now, right now those aren't in this current model, but could be easily added as just one more thing you keep in track of. Um, like we say, we think that the tax would have this effect. Um, and now, if you're a foreign country, now from the perspective of France, taxing a foreign company using this strategy is going to be even more attractive presumably because more Americans own stock in Facebook than French people own stock in Facebook. So, but why not? So the first thing is if you have these tax taxes that end at a border, that's gonna potentially create an additional distortion if there are international network effects. So that's one thing to keep track of that I'm not modeling here. And then a second thing that's not modeling here. So what keeps this from going to infinity? What keeps France from setting a 50% digital service tax if it's good for them rather than a 3% digital service tax? Well, I think Proposition 22 in California gives us a hint. Does anybody remember, does that, was anybody following Proposition 22 in California? Okay, then this is a fun little story. This will be a good way to close out. So in California, um, there was a movement uh, to try to get Uber and Lyft and all of the big sort of uh, gig economy platforms to offer more generous contracts to the people who uh, did the work for them. So the contractors for Uber, the people who drive for Uber and Lyft, et cetera. The way that this would have basically cashed out is as sort of a compensation floor for those people, right? So the, basically regulations, raising the amount of sort of fringe benefits that the contractors would get, treating them more analogous to employees than contractors. In the context of our model, you can view this as sort of a forced increase in, or a forced change in the price to what's being charged one side to the platform. So in other words, Facebook is gonna have to subsidize the driver side of the platform more or charge them less, right? This is kind of similar to the logic of the tax that we just talked about. So what keeps, but what happens? So when this ballot initiative was proposed, Uber and Lyft said, we will just stop operating in California if you pass this law, right? And what happened? The voters in California totally backed down. They totally said, you know what, Uber and Lyft, we'd love it if you were nicer to your drivers, but we'd be really, really sad if there was no Uber and Lyft. And California 100% backed down, right? And so what that suggests is that the ratio of platform profit to user surplus is gonna be really important for understanding who's gonna win these fights moving forward in terms of taxes on the digital economy. Because our sort of old principles of, you know, taxes are always bad might not super apply here in terms of consumer welfare. Uh, finally, I have a couple of results about regulation. Um, like I said before, this is going to capture Alex's intuition that if you break up um, the platform without getting any additional competition, it's kind of a lose-lose. But we also imagine what if we were able to achieve perfect competition with interoperability, so there's no destruction of network effects. Um, and as you can see, uh, social welfare goes up by 4.5% in this perfect competition scenario, so it kind of gets you halfway to the first best. Um, whereas uh, a vertical breakup or a horizontal breakup that doesn't boost competition at all are going to be varying amounts of bad. Um, yeah, and so those are the headline results. And finally, I just kind of want to close with a call to action. Um, so our calibration is going to be in many ways limited. We're, in, we're based on this imperfect survey data. Um, in order to calibrate the model, we're going to have to assume that all of these aspects of the utility function are linear. But um, as far as I know, the, and having talked to Facebook, I'm pretty confident that this is sort of the most uh, robust model, structural model of a social network out there for trying to ask these sort of policy questions. For policymakers to make wise choices, they need to be able to compel platforms to share data and identify that we need to identify demand curves and network effects. And platforms and regulators should develop and contrast quantitative models so that we can kind of start moving past more quantitative qualitative debates about the role of taxes and regulations 
and actually start putting numbers next to each other and saying, well, I think X, I think X will go up 5%. No, I think Y will go down 2%. So thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> very interesting. Uh, now let me invite Alex White to provide uh, a, a short discussion. Okay, thank you. Interesting set of topics in this paper and I enjoy I enjoyed reading it. Oh, sorry, can everybody hear me? I, I'm getting a beep in my Bluetooth. You, you got it? Okay. No, now we, so can, thank, we can thank, hear you. Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, very interesting set of issues and, and discussion in the paper. I just want to make a couple of quick comments. Um, so the um, it's definitely, from a theoretical perspective, kind of a puzzle why Facebook doesn't seem to be profit maximizing according to the specification of the model. I think that intuitively we, we all sort of agree that that's what we would expect to happen, but it doesn't really happen in the model. And so I think it, along your, uh, in your list of um, potential reasons, it's good to talk, it, it would be good to think a bit more about competition. It's after all, what you have is a monopoly model and so due to the fact that it's a monopoly model, you're probably getting a prediction that their profit maximizing behavior involves higher prices than what you would get in a model with competition among different social networks. Now, of course, you could respond to that immediately by saying that, well, Facebook basically is a monopoly. Um, and so why do we need to take competition seriously? Um, but this gets to a broader issue in this debate. And just if you look, for example, at the um, recent reports, wonderful reports by people like Jacques Cremer and Fiona Scott Morton, and then the Furman report in the UK, a big theme there is the distinction between competition in the market, right? So it would be like two different ver Facebook A and Facebook B who compete head to head versus competition for the market. And I think everybody kind of agrees that to the extent that market forces can discipline platforms, it has to be driven by some version of competition for the market rather than sort of plain vanilla competition in the market. And what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that there are gonna be startups or um, you know, less, less popular competitors who are there constantly acting whose shadow is constantly disciplining the dominant firm from behaving in a way that's anti-competitive or harmful to consumers or not. And um, I mean, I think that at the moment, people feel as though this threat of competition for the market is not a sufficiently strong disciplining factor, but it's also an issue that needs to be studied more. And so I'm a bit hesitant to just draw model, draw, um, conclusions from a monopoly model when I think that um, what we're really interested in, in in these markets is understanding under what circumstances can competition, can or cannot competition for the market act as a disciplining device to induce good behavior by a dominant platform. So that's sort of a broad um, thematic issue that I think would be interesting to, to add to your list. Um, also, I, I should mention that um, there's a paper about, by Am about Amazon by Reimers and Waldfogel called the Throwing the Books at Them, where um, they also address a similar puzzle of why Amazon doesn't seem to be behaving in a profit maximizing way with respect to its, uh, I think it's with the, with the, the book pricing. So um, you, you, you might check that out. And while I'm on the topic of, of um, quantitative models of platform competition. There's a forthcoming paper by Min Jae Song looking at advertising in, um, uh, I think, new, uh, magazines. Um, it, it's coming out in AEJ Micro that involves a, a structural model, structural estimation exercise, um, you know, effectively in two-sided markets. And I, I think that that hasn't caught your attention. So take a, take a look at that. Um, the other um point that i just want to briefly mention you, you didn't really talk about it in the in the talk so i'd be happy to discuss it more offline but with respect to well i guess it'd be it'd be online but 
not with everybody else here. The the um, uh, the, the the question I have is about the need for approximation in your solution to the model. So your model is um, very similar to the Wild 2010 model, the AR paper, which uh, you know you, you you certainly mention and acknowledge. Um, I think there's some confusion about the technical aspects of that paper and the insulating tariffs. So in that monopoly model, um, one question is, how do you write, what, what are the dimensions of maximization in solving that model? And then another question is, how does the platform impl implement the solution? And um, the the way it works is that you can maximize a multi-sided platform model with respect to the number of users served on each side and come up with an exact first order condition for the um, representing the, the solution. And that pins down the, the optimal price for the platform, the optimal actual final price that the platform wants to charge. And then the problem is that if the platform just announces those prices, there can be multiple equilibria in the next stage of the game. And it's in response to that problem that um, Glenn uses the idea of insulating tariffs, which is, you know, it comes from this paper by um, uh, in, in the in the 70s in Journal of Public Economics, sim similar idea. Um, uh, where, where they where they talk about it in implementing a public good, but the point the point is that contingent pricing in in the context of um, monopoly two sided markets is a separate issue from how to identify the um, the optimal prices. And so I think you might get you might you might be able to rewrite your maximization problem just with respect to the number of users served on each side and not have to deal with the approximation. So I, I can explain that more. Um, um, you know, without everybody having to worry about the details, but I think that that could make things simpler for you. So, um, and, and I like very much your, your idea of using surveys to elicit data about people's willingness to pay for Facebook. That's not my area of expertise, but it certainly is, is nice to see that because it's something that I'm very interested in and have never done myself. So, um, um, very good. Um, I think, I think that's that those are the points I wanted to, to make. So uh, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Alex. So uh, let me, yes, so so Seth, um, before we move on to general QA, uh, feel free to, to respond to Alex. So yeah, Alex, thank you so much for those really thoughtful comments. Um, thing number one, obviously, we we writing this paper, we thought really hard about is Facebook really a monopolist? Um, we leaned away from modeling explicit comp market competition in the model because we were worried about uh, creating too many multiple equilibria. So it's kind of a modeling simplification to think about a monopoly. Um, but I th the model, I think if we could estimate a cost of entry of entering with a Facebook replacement, I think that could be incorporated to the model. It's just how, how am I supposed to calibrate that? And, and if you have any papers or ideas about how to think about um, calibrating the threat of entry, I'd be, that's something I'd love to try to incorporate. Um, and, but yes, clearly our shadow value of Facebook wanting a large user base is a combination of both what, what you might think of this anti-competitive uh, motivation, right? Building a big moat so that no one else can enter against you, as well as maybe these more pro-social motivations. And you're hundred percent right, which is in order to understand the welfare impacts of our different simulations, you would really want to understand which of those two those are, um, as well as thinking more seriously about monopolies just generally. Yeah, remind me, just sorry to, sorry to interrupt, I just remind there's this there's a new paper by Zingales and co-authors about the kill zone that you might take a take a look at. That's quite a that's quite an interesting paper on that topic. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea too. Um, so along those lines, I guess what I would say is, even though we do have this sort of simulation of perfect competition in there, that is competition in the market, right? That is imagining that all of Facebook's kind of secret information becomes available and then people can enter with just basically portals to read that news feed and read that social graph. So 
that is a scenario that has been painted that you could kind of maybe get competition in the market. Again, most of this paper is more thinking about managing a natural monopoly than about how would you go about encouraging or harnessing competition. Um, the, min, the, min, the model that you talked about, magazine advertisements and a multi-sided platform, reminds me a lot of the Reisman paper on multi-sided platforms in the, in the yellow pages with advertisements. So that's a paper I'm familiar with and certainly have learned from, but I'm looking forward to reading about this paper. Um, and then this sort of insulating tariff discussion. Yeah, we can talk about whether computationally it would be better or not to try to use that approach. I think that as a practical matter, we, we wrote down utility functions such that there's gonna be a unique equilibrium with these nice logit demand curves. Um, but uh, so I'm not super worried about like insulating, am I at a local equilibrium, it's local maximum instead of global maximum. I'm not so worried about that. Um, and I think that there's some sort of, just sort of realism and just sort of intuitive clarity about talking about real world uh, pricing. Rather well, no, but this is, my, this, is, this is my whole point, which is that to solve the maximization problem with respect to number of users rather than with respect to price, you're not using insulating tariffs. You're just representing, and what one can represent the problem as a as a problem with respect to quantity and get exact solutions without the need for approximation that imputes the prices that infers prices and then you just say those are the prices it doesn't have anything to do with it's it's, it's simply a question of how you represent the so the problem not a question of the platform's behavior in a monopoly Fair. model so that's that's my point Fair, fairly put all uh, right yeah let's take some questions so uh, if uh, whoever has a question, I think you just feel free to unmute and, and ask it. Jack, ever? Are you need to, you're on mute, Jack. You're on mute, Jack. Yeah, okay. well, thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, really a good work. It's kind of nice to have a paper which looks at bigger policy issues. We don't do enough of those in economics. Uh, the, the, my question is about how do you model your model of advertising? Are you assuming that if you decrease advertising by half, the revenue will decrease by half so that there is no price elasticity of advertising? Yeah, so we're so we we another big simplification in this model is we're going to view we, we, is exactly that. So there's going to be a linear relationship between advertising revenues and user disutility. So if you cut advertising revenues by half, we, we're not literally keeping track of number of ads. We're keeping track of disutility caused by ads. So if you decrease the disutility caused by ads by half, you're going to lower your revenues by half. Okay, do you have, I mean, this seems to be a very strong assumption and seems to be rather important because the yes. uh, incentive, I mean, all the revenue part is, uh, is, is crucial there. So do you have any idea of how, whether you, how you could test this or, uh, you know? So the way that we calibrate that? it here is we ask people about how much that they would value an ad-free Facebook. So how much would you, we, we do a willingness to pay experiment. So how much would you be willing to pay? to eliminate ads on Facebook, which I, get, I guess, which totally is not perfect. Um, I know I'm vaguely aware of some uh, papers that in particular platforms look at, you know, how, how elastic is users to number of advertisements. Um, we could try to grab some parameters from them. Um, but as far, I, I am not aware, and I'm really eager if anybody you guys know that looks at a nonlinear relationship between advertisements and disutility. Um, so that, I think that's a really important open question, right? Both like, what is the social, I mean, that's a, I wish I had marketing PhD friends that could answer this question. Like, is, is there social value to advertising and how bad are they for us privately in terms of unpleasantness? Because certainly it's probably not nonlinear and it's probably highly nonlinear in real life. I think the only way to do this research is to roam the bars around the offices of Facebook and <laughs> get uh, engineers drunk and get them to, <laughs> to tell you the truth. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and exactly. And that l l led me to my final point, which is a lot of the information you would want to know to really model Facebook properly is private information that Facebook has. Yeah. And I guess that's a common problem in antitrust, but it's, it's really exacerbated in this setting. So Seth, uh, uh, Hesky has a question. So Hesky, can you just unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, it's uh, it's less a question, more just a comment following up from, from Jack's observation. So, you know, some of the consumers are a bigger deal in terms of their network externalities. And for advertisers as well, some some uh, consumers are more valuable to, to advertise to. So um, this is just kind of exacerbating the, the treating advertisements uniformly is... Um, uh, a little counter to the application. So we uh, we allow for price discrimination. So yeah, in the model, the model does allow for Facebook to charge. It, it's third degree price discrimination. So different groups, user groups, are allowed to be charged uh, different levels of advertising. Uh, at least, at least in in so the model. So I yeah. I um. So when yeah. you run your advertising counterfactual, you do the same. Uh. I think it's possible. Uh, I have to look at it. Um, I know that in some of these simulations, we allow for full price discrimination across the groups. And I know that in some of them, um, we do not. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember which simulations are which. But, but certainly my code allows for it. <laughs> so can I ask a question about the assumption or I, maybe I missed uh, one point about the impact of advertising because you seem to assume that people dislike ads. So I believe that this is a good assumption in yellow pages world, but uh, for Facebook- It's funny because he, he, he has the opposite assumption in yellow pages world, but keep going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but you know, at least people believe that, you know, people dislike ads in general. Uh, in standard, uh, you know, when I'm interested in content, but Facebook does more than that, right? They are matching also your, what you want to see in the news feed. And this is more about matching my taste to the content rather than showing me, you know, just ads, uh, random ads. So how should we then take this point into account in the, in the analysis? That's a really good point. And the, the way I would think of it is as a, just another way of, of saying Jacques' point, right? Which is in the real world, there's probably lots of nonlinearities. The, the way I would put it is, it's gotta be that at the margin that these advertisements are disutilitous, right? Because at the margin, they've gotta be crowding out better content or else you just show a news feed of advertisements, right? So again, what we're trying to figure out is sort of at the margin, what is the disutility from raising another dollar of advertisements in terms of disutility of using the platform? That's the number we would wanna know in principle. And that would be sort of locally correct, even if sort of inframarginally sort of like the very first ad that you show me is really valuable and helps me a lot and actually raises my utility. There's gotta be at some point at which the hundredth ad is having a negative marginal effect. And that's kind of the way I would interpret it is the more you're worried that this is a problem, the more you should think, well, I'm only going to trust Seth's model locally. I also have a question about these margins because uh, at the beginning, I thought that you are measuring in the model with the probability of usage, the intensity of usage. But then no, when it, you set up the survey, it was more like participation margin. So no. I think these things might not be necessarily the same, right? Uh, so people... Uh, who value Facebook user, who value Facebook membership might be valuing it just to see others content rather than using it themselves. So then there might be some mismatch between the usage intensity and the membership. So I don't know. So, uh, this, yes. yeah. so the second part of that, I think we have, I, I, we do have heterogeneous network effects. So it can be the case that some people like being connected to another person, but don't uh, but don't provide value back to them. So that, that we have. What we don't have that you're right to point out is, um, I'm sorry, I totally lost it. What, what? <laughs> it, it, 
what margin you are talking about because i was also confused when you right. presented the model i thought that you were measuring oh yeah we don't we usage. don't have intent sorry yes I, when i was speaking uh, at the early on i was speaking very loosely about intensity what i should have say is people like seth benzel use it less on average right instead of saying set any individual ex ante is going to 100 percent participate or 100 percent not participate but because we're thinking about a bunch of people within a demographic group i was loosely saying um, yeah, so people like Seth are participating 30% less, right? Um, you're totally right that intensity is another margin we could think about here, and that actually might be the next thing that we add to the model. That is important. Thank you. So um, I will stop the recording now. Uh, let me thank uh, Seth and, and Alex uh, uh, for the presentation discussion for the purpose of a recording, but uh, feel free to stay and discuss. I'm, I'm staying, staying here as well.